Today's case brings us to South Dublin in Ireland and to Glenagiri, which is part of the seaside town Dunleary. A town that is full of life with a great community and a great choice of places to eat. And if you fancy it, there is nice bars to frequent and to unwind and have a drink or two. It is very close to Dublin city centre, but not too close. You escape the crowds and fast living lifestyle while only being a half an hour train or bus journey away from the city. This brings us back to September the 3rd, 1999. It was a warm day, and that night in a dimly lit laneway known locally as the Cut, 17 year old Renee Murray, she walked alone. The lane connected Silchester Road with Silchester Crescent. She was minutes from her home on Silchester Avenue, carrying her bag and a bag from a local boutique she worked at. At some point, while Renee was walking through the laneway, she was attacked. She was stabbed 30 times and her attacker fled. Renee had stumbled through the laneway and eventually collapsing when she reached Silchester Crescent, with her home just a stone's throw away. And at around 12.30am that night, Renee's older sister pulled up outside a house at the end of the road, in a taxi. As Renee's sister and her friends exited the taxi, they noticed something lying on the ground. And as they got closer, they realised it was Renee. Renee's sister witnessing this, she then ran to her house to get help from her parents and her brother. While one of the girls, who was a nurse, stayed with Renee and looked for a pulse. But unfortunately, it was too late. And Renee succumbed to her injuries. The Gardaí were then notified and a murder investigation began. Renee Murray was born on January the 6th, 1982. She was the youngest of three children. She was an avid reader and a poetry fan. She had attended a private all-girls school in Kalini, where she worked hard for her future. She dreamed on becoming a writer, and she had planned on pursuing this dream through college. In the summer of 1999, Renee had left her job selling at the ferry terminal in Dunleary. Her next job would be at a fashion boutique in the local shopping centre. She became a valuable employee, she got along with all the customers and was said to be kind, helpful and very competent in her job. When Renee was murdered, the locals were scared. How could such a vicious attack take place in their town and to such a young girl? All while the perpetrator was still walking the streets. Renee's funeral mass was held on Tuesday the 7th of September in the local church. There were no empty seats in sight. Renee was loved and respected by everyone who had the privilege to be in her life. And they all showed up to pay their respects to Renee and her family that day. A number of items that Renee loved were brought forward at the Mass. This included a teddy bear backpack, music she liked, and some clothes. Renee was then buried in the Shangana Cemetery. After the burial, the Gardaí were just at the beginning of their investigation, trying to piece together exactly what happened that night, and if this was a targeted murder or a crime of opportunity. September 3rd, 1999 had been a normal day. Renee's intention was to travel into the city centre that day to sign up for some subjects for her repeat year in college. But she slept in and she ran to college to tell them she had no time to go into town, as she had a shift and a job that day, and as she woke up late, and she wouldn't be able to make it into college. There was a sale going on on a job that day, and Deirdre Renee's mother popped into her shop, to see if she could find any deals. When she left to continue her shopping, Renee said to her mother, Bye mom, I'll see you later but Deirdre would never see her daughter alive again. After Renee had finished her shift, 
CCTV showed her leaving the store and heading toward the exit with her colleague. After her shift in work, she was worked up and she needed to unwind with some friends over some drinks. She would meet them in Scott's pub, which was just across the road, and she had been here many times before. From here, they wanted to continue on with their night and go dancing to the nearby nightclub Paparazzi. This was only a few doors away from the pub, but Renee had come straight from work, so she wasn't dressed for the occasion. She said she would go home and change, and meet him back at the nightclub at around 12am. So she left Scott's pub, and she began her journey back home at around 20 past 11. Renee was then attacked and murdered as she made her way home. A crime like this was never heard of in the area of Dunleary. Gary could not find any motive why this would have happened. She was not sexually assaulted or she was not the victim of a robbery. So why would anyone murder a 17 year old girl? The murder weapon was never found but was believed to be a large blade like a kitchen knife. And the fatal wound given to Renee was from a severed artery caused by a puncture to her left armpit and she died from shock and blood loss. A hair not belonging to Renee was found at the scene and DNA was found under her fingernails. But Gardy were unable to match anything with the evidence found and they were hitting a wall with the investigation. From here they began interviewing Renee's friends to find out about her personal life, if there could have been anyone in her life that might have wanted to hurt her. At this point, Gardy also appealed for witnesses in the area to reach out, and one witness that lived behind the lane said they heard a woman at about 10 past 12 saying go away, leave me alone and fuck off. They didn't report this at the time, as they thought it was just a young couple arguing and it didn't last for any more than 30 seconds. Another witness had said they had seen Renee at the junction just at the lower Glenagiri Roads at 3 minutes past 12. All the laneways in the area were checked for the weapon, along with bins and any area a killer would likely hide it. The weekend following the murder checkpoints were set up asking people if they had seen anything that might assist the police in their investigation. Given the weapon used in the attack, professional chefs in the area were questioned and at this point, Gardy had taken over 600 statements in relation to the case. When Gardy had gathered all statements from Renee's friends, one stood out to them. When they were out a few weeks previous, Renee danced with a man in a nightclub paparazzi. Her friends didn't know the man. He was said to be between 19 and 22 years old. He was thin, tall and spiked up his hair. He wore sunglasses and he sounded a little bit posh and they thought he must be local. That night he was with a group of lads in the club. Renee and the man left the club together and they were seen later at the Abracababra takeaway restaurant. This is a popular place to go after a night out to get some messy food. Here the two had chatted for a while. A little while later she arrived back at her friend's apartment, upset saying she wanted to go home, but she wouldn't tell her friend what had happened. Her friend then called her a taxi home, where she waited until it arrived. The friend didn't know exactly what had happened to Renee, but she gathered she may have been followed while walking home that night. Along with this statement, another member of the public called the guardie with some information. A taxi man said he had picked up a passenger about an hour after Renaud had been killed. And the passenger was a man and he said he had been in a local nightclub and that he wanted to get home before his girlfriend. The man had given the taxi man an address and it looked like he had dark coloured stains on his top that he was trying to conceal. And during the journey, the passenger changed the location he wanted to go and brought the taxi driver in a loop. 
and the address the taxi driver finally dropped him to was very close to the original address he had given. When the man got out, he walked toward a house, but the taxi man didn't see him go into the house. He said he saw him hide behind a bush, and he waited for the taxi driver to drive off. So why would he have given the taxi driver an address and then change at last minute? Also while trying to hide in a bush, trying to make it look like he went into a house when he actually didn't. The guardie checked the addresses given. There was no man his age or description living at any of these addresses. During traffic stops, the guardie brought a photo fit of the description of the guy. And four people said they seen the man at Scruples nightclub, the same night as Renee's death. The man was then identified as a chef and he worked in the Dunleary area and he had a history of drug use. He was then arrested on O'Connell Street in early 2000. When arrested he was carrying a knife to which he explained was used for his job as a chef. The knife was then tested but there was no match with the attack on Renaud Murray. This suspect, he was never publicly named, and the police, they let him go. Later in 2001, the passenger was in prison after he assaulted a woman outside a nightclub. A man he came into contact with in the prison said he confessed to him, saying he had killed Renaud because she wouldn't have sex with him. But during his interview, he denied having any knowledge of Renaud or having anything to do with her death. He was the prime suspect to the Gardaí and they focused their investigation on him. With this, a woman contacted the Gardaí with another tip, saying they see him Renaud on the upper Glenagiri road arguing with a man. She described the man as thin, with messy hair and wearing light colour cargo trousers. She described him as looking like one of the Gallagher brothers from the band known as Oasis. A man in Renee's social circle matching this description, he was questioned, but he provided an alibi to the Gardaí. And sadly, after these tips, there were no further breakthroughs in the case. Years began to pass, and then it turns into another cold case. As the years turned into more years, a third suspect came to light. A female that had fallen out with Renaud. Friends said she was violent and jealous of Renaud. The female was then questioned, along with her boyfriend who was said to like Renaud, which may be the reason why she was jealous and why the pair had fallen out. The both of them were questioned but denied any knowledge, and they have since left the country. In 2008, there was a cold case review into Renee's murder, and it is alleged the main suspect, which I believe to be the chef, was not properly questioned and he was treated leniently in the early stages of the investigation. Unusual behaviour by the suspect in the period after the murder was ignored, and it is believed the main suspect attended a party on the night of the murder, and the house was never adequately searched by the Gardaí, despite the number of unusual events that took place there. This suspect lives in Dublin, they are prone to aggressive outbursts, they take medication for violent mood swings, and they have assaulted at least one other woman. And at this point, there is no evidence linking him to the murder, and it is very likely the only thing that would bring justice to the man would be his very own confession. Throughout the years, Renaud's grave was targeted by vandalism and items that were left on the grave were stolen. The case remains unsolved with the Gardaí admitting they are no closer to the truth now than they were 20 years ago. 
Renee's death left a deep void in her family's life. She is missed dearly and her family deserve peace and justice for her. If anyone has any information on Renee's murder, please contact the Dunleary Garda station on 1800 666 111. Thank you for watching and I'll see you on the next one.